Uh, first, I want to begin by acknowledging that we're gathered today on the Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis, and I want to pay my respects to all community members, past, present, emerging, and recognize their continuing connections and relationships with land, water, and ancestors that provide ongoing care and stewardship. I want to thank Cheyenne Jones. I don't know if she's here, but I want to thank her for making my travel arrangements for <laughs> dealing with the ups and downs of crossing this border um, from small airport to small airport and getting me where I needed to be last night and hopefully uh, home tomorrow. Um, I also want to thank all of the people who I have not met yet but who made this event possible. We're apparently having an emergency alert. Okay, just letting you know. <laughs> Um, IT support, Terry and Al, thank you very much for dealing with my Mac and for have putting up a second camera so that I can have my notes. Uh, I appreciate your support. Facility operations, maintenance staff, food services, your work is valued and seen. Thank you. Um, finally, thanks to Craig Harkema and the organizing committee for inviting me to speak at Access 27. Uh, 2017. When I got the invitation, I was reminded that my colleague at Washington State University, Alex Merrill, who was then the head of digital initiatives at the libraries, and I was uh, just a newly associate professor and actually coming off of a sabbatical in Australia and at the plenary for Access 2011 in Vancouver. Um, so our talk focused then on the ethics of displaying Native American cultural materials online, specifically through the Plateau People's Web Portal, a project that grew from the WSU Library's commitment to engaging with tribal nations in our region. So more broadly, though, um, my portion of that talk highlighted this tension between the sort of open to the public notion under which most academic libraries function. The presumption, that is, that openness is a default for access, and it is a public good that we strive for without question. That set against the diverse sets of relationships to knowledge and sharing that indigenous communities bring to bear on the circulation of knowledge that troubles this default understanding of openness and professional standards. So in that talk, how many were at Access 2011? Okay, maybe you remember. I don't, but I couldn't. <laughs> couldn't even find the slides, but I had the title, so I'm guessing. In that talk, I emphasized the limits of the notions of openness as they relate not only to digital collections, but more broadly to how we, in libraries, archives, and scholarly research endeavors, imagine, construct, and put into practice an often uncritical understanding of openness that pits in opposition open and closed as two endpoints that are working against one another. One, bright and shiny, orange and inviting, and new, and the other, dark, dreary, gray, closed, and old. Instead of as nodes in a vast network of types of circulation, exchange, and sharing that invite us to see our interactions as engaged, enmeshed, and interdependent on one another, as well as the natural world. So my talk today runs parallel to that argument about openness from 2011 by connecting indigenous sovereignty, attempts at reconciliation, and ongoing struggles towards decolonization with the principles that govern, sometimes tacitly and sometimes explicitly, the dissemination, preservation, and sharing of the materials, that is the knowledge and the relationships that are in our libraries and archives, in the reading rooms, in the storerooms, library guides, in digital files, in databases, and content management systems. The title of my talk, The Trouble with Access, is meant to foreground this paradox of opening collections while closing off relationships, of claiming neutrality while creating policies that erase and disavow diverse systems of knowing and being, of building technological platforms that are meant to democratize but are blind to the power structures they embed. The trouble with access, then, is the oftentimes willful not seeing of indigenous knowledge systems, the sort of blind invocation of universal access and the celebration of open access in particular that all too quickly aligns open access with decolonization of library practices in general and particularly with digital collections. 
So I began by acknowledging the Métis and First Nations communities on whose land we're gathered out of respect for what's ongoing, but also to highlight what settler colonial logics have sought to marginalize. What Anishinaabe writer, scholar, poet, activist, and mother, Leanne Simpson calls, quote, the elephant in the room, land. That is, she reminds us, colonial dispossession and ongoing settler states are founded on, quote, the removal of indigenous bodies from indigenous lands. And as such, it must be the starting point for any discussion about decolonization, sovereignty, or access to knowledge. Respecting and providing physical access to land is about recognizing the importance of the deeply rooted systems of knowledge embedded within them and a simultaneous acknowledgement of the reciprocal relationships that sustain them. That is, we cannot separate access to land and access to knowledge. As part of the Idle No More movement that sought to stop the ongoing usurpation of indigenous land, Simpson traveled throughout Canada speaking about sovereignty and land. And what she found was that people wanted to know what did she or the movement want? What did she want? I want my great-grandchildren to be able to fall in love with every piece of our territory. I want their bodies to carry with them every story, every song, every piece of poetry hidden in our Anishinaabe language. I want them to be able to dance through their lives with joy. I want them to live without fear because they know respect, because they know in their bones what respect feels like. I want them to live without fear because they have a pristine environment and clean waterways that will provide them with the physical and emotional sustenance to uphold their responsibilities to the land, their families, their communities, and their nations. I want them to be valued, heard, and cherished by our communities and by Canada, no matter what their skin color, their physical and mental abilities, their sexual, gender, or relationship orientation. I want my great-great-grandchildren and their great-great-grandchildren to be able to live as Machisagik and Anishinaabek, unharassed and undeterred in our homeland. The idea of my arms embracing my grandchildren and their arms embracing their grandchildren is communicated in the Anishinaabe word kobade. According to Elder Edna Manitowabe, kobade is a word we use to refer to our great-grandparents and our great-grandchildren. It means a link in a chain. A link in a chain between generations, between nations, between states of being, between individuals. I'm a link in a chain. We are all links in a chain. Simpson's reply to what does she want provides us with a clear way forward and an apt set of questions to reflect on today. What does it mean for libraries, archives, and museums as institutions and those of us working in them as administrators, archivists, librarians, information specialists, to provide a space for indigenous people to be valued, heard, and cherished. Spaces free from fear, but filled with respect that can be felt in their bones. What does it mean for us all to be links in a chain that stretches back to a difficult past and reaches to an uncertain future? A chain that moves over and through peopled and storied lands to our institutions, as places built into these indigenous homelands, where connections between elders and youth, between trees, mountains, and lakes are part of active knowledge systems. What Simpson reminds us is that we cannot separate and disentangle these relationships as much as we might like to. We cannot separate access to digital technologies, databases, collections, and archives from access to the web of relations and systems of knowing on which they are built, from the land, from ancestors, from each other. What I am suggesting today is that we trouble access, that we move against the grain of political inaction and disavow and stand up for the connections between territorial and intellectual sovereignty in our institutions, that we refuse to ignore the elephant in the room, and instead we go from tip to tail and undo the structures that maintain active forms of not seeing, not hearing, and not knowing. We cannot offer up bland notions of diversity and invocations of multiculturalism 
that prop up the ad indigeneity and stir narrative. Instead, we can move to action, sustain tearing down, starting over, building anew with a different foundation, new scaffolding and structures that move both vertically and horizontally within our organizations. Physical access to land requires recognition, respect, acknowledgement of relationships, and reciprocity. Access to our collections in whatever forms they take requires the same. It requires that we grapple with their relationships and histories, that we engage in respectful engage of, in exchange of knowledge, that we acknowledge our part in their removal and destruction, and that we provide meaningful solutions the, to the conditions of access that they require based on indigenous systems of knowing. To follow Simpson's challenge to us all, I want to share some of my experiences and collaborations with indigenous communities, collections, and curation by taking a look back over that time since my first access conference in 2011, when I spoke about the Plateau People's Web Portal, and where we are now in 2017, both with the portal, but with these discussions and ongoing debates about access, to draw some connections to the webs of relation or the links in a chain that Simpson so powerfully invites us all to foreground. So be besides the obvious facelift between the two versions of the Plateau People's Web Portal that you see here, I want to focus on what is underneath the surface, the relationships, the structures, and the policies that move this from a project to a practice, that is, from a one-time digitization program in our libraries to an ongoing commitment to engagement with tribal nations across our university. The Plateau People's Web Portal is a collaboration between eight tribal nations across Oregon, Idaho, Washington, and Montana, with Washington State University Libraries, several regional and national partner collecting institutions, including the Smithsonian Institution and the Library of Congress. But the collaboration began with a memorandum of understanding between the university and the tribal nations on whose land were built, based on an overarching MOU that WSU has with 12 nations in the region. MOUs are in fact a very productive instrument for redressing previous collection and curation policies that left native needs out of the equation. These agreements are understandings they provide a pathway for new relationships at a government-to-government -government level that fundamentally begins with indigenous sovereignty, a recognition that, yes, we are built on your land, a recognition of past wrongs and concrete steps towards a new future. The MOU at our university was designed by the Native American Advisory Board to the president to promote sharing resources and expanding education opportunities at all levels across campus. The MOU states that, quote, WSU and the signatory tribes will work to promote mutual cooperation to improve WSU's efforts by providing educational services to Native American populations and to promote a better understanding of Native American issues. This could be, I realize, seen as very vague. But as part of our newly formed Center for Digital Scholarship and Curation that I direct at WSU, we made this part of our mission and our vision and a clear guideline for our work. So we listened to the Native American Advisory Board when they described how they wanted access to their collections. Specifically, they wanted a multi-tribal portal, and they had at least four things that they wanted. It had to be online so tribal members across states could access it. It had to include library, museum, and archival collections from across the state, the region, and the nation. They wanted a one-stop shop. They didn't want to go hunting for collections that had already been taken once. And it was important to include many types of native knowledge about the content, not that which we deemed scholarly. And to incorporate that at the item level. Those of you who deal with content management systems and digital asset management systems know that we like the high level, files, folders, collections, but it was individual items, the belongings, that's where we needed the native knowledge. And most importantly, tribal decision making over content that was posted and how that would be accessed. 
So to begin then, we worked with tribal representatives, again, in a government-to-government -government relationship, to, divine, to define the pathways for content to be accessed according to their own tribal local protocols. It was essential to ground the collections in their homelands. So the representatives we worked with chose the image of the Columbia River, that's the background, for both versions of the portal. It was in fact, and it is one of the only things that has stayed um, present over the last uh, eight or nine years. Because it, because it is that connectedness that plateau people have to the river that runs throughout the region that connects them, that grounds them. And it was each, the, the fact that each nation then within this region had its own path for their tribal content. So while the Columbia River foregrounds shared histories and tribal connections, the paths highlight their sovereignty as individual nations that run over the land. Tribal administrators, chosen by their own internal governing principles, manage and curate content that is related to them and they decide how to share that content across communities as they choose. So each tribe has a community page. Here you can see the Coeur d'Alene tribes page. The community page allows each tribe to define their community path with individual welcomes as text or as audio and video. <laughs> So we are, we are all welcomed to the Coeur d'Alene page. Hearing the language, seeing the land, the water, the trees are powerful reminders that the content you're about to see is part of this landscape. There are also lists of cultural protocols for access. This one shows the public access protocol. So the content we see here is specifically and consciously made public. There is no default to public for any content. Members are in fact added to protocols based on their community relations. Without being part of any other protocol, an individual will only see what has been purposefully made public, all of us. So in order to follow tribal protocols for access, before any digitization of content, we start with physical materials. Our workflow is defined by a collaborative curation model that begins with tribal members selecting materials to be digitized from local, national, and regional archives. We do not digitize or display any content without approval. This is significant. What I'm suggesting here is that the reliance on takedown notices by some institutions replays the cultural violences of the original physical dispossession of materials. Once content is online and circulating, the damage is done. Relying on takedown notices relieves us of our responsibility to act ethically. It breaks the links in the chain. By slowing down and listening to knowledge holders, we can foreground those relationships and privilege indigenous circulation routes, those webs of connection. And so as part of the collaborative curation process, we also use the tribal representative's own categories for the materials. There are now 12 categories in the portal. We started with nine and added those over the years by the representatives. They're chosen and updated as needed and then individual keywords are added by each tribe for their material to allow the flexibility of local vernaculars. So we do not default to any controlled vocabularies or subject headings, Library of Congress or otherwise because they have been hostile to indigenous ways of knowing and describing themselves. Uh, this has been written about in scholarship um, for years. I highly recommend the 2015 Cataloging and Classification Quarterly Special um, that has a lot of uh, First Nations authors, specifically on indigenous knowledge and subject headings, um, if you want to know more. But taken as a whole, this process of collaborative curation, this set of governing principles, is a process that we call digital return, whereby collections are not just digitized, handed back, and treated as surrogates of originals, but where belongings are returned as part of a process of building relationships of respect by indi embedding indigenous protocols for description, use, and access of those materials into the process at all levels, MOU, digitization workflows, design decisions, categorization. 
So by 2011, when I first came to Access, the Access Conference, we had two major U.S. institutions collaborating with us on the portal through MOUs and a commitment to the collaborative curation model. So at that point, we asked the tribal representatives if there were other institutions we should approach about collections. Indeed, there were, both regionally and nationally and internationally. The Northwest Museum of Art and Culture in Spokane and the British Museum in London both held huge plateau collections. The former was more well known in the area than the latter. So we began first by listening to several elders' stories about the significance of salmon, the river, the valleys, and we connected material objects to places. So although the construction of both the Chief Joseph, Joseph and the Grand Coulee Dams that you see here over a century, half century ago have eliminated the traditional salmon runs, the histories are still told, and the salmon chief is an important figure in communities along the Columbia River. The Spokane Tribe Salmon Chief's War Club was removed from their homelands long before the salmon runs stopped. Sometime between 1858 and 1861, near Kettle Falls at Fort Colville. As the fur trade was beginning to bring native and non-natives together, John Keast Lord, a veterinarian and assistant naturalist for the Boundary Survey on the northwest coast of the United States, collected artifacts and compiled a quite detailed and lengthy ethnological document with the assistance from the Hudson Bay Company. It was during this time that Lord acquired what he called, quote, a Celt, that he later donated to the British Museum. He notes quite clearly the provenance, however, in his 1866 publication. Quote, an illustration attached to this work represents three Spokane Indians photographed at Fort Colville. The Celt made of flint also figured in the illustration page, the finest mounted specimen at present in the British Museum collection. I obtained from the Indian on the left side of the group they had no history of it further than it was of great age and had been handed down from chief to chief for many generations, end quote. The Spokane community most certainly knew the history, although they chose not to share the intimate tribal knowledge with Lord, so he presumed its absence. However, in September of 2012, I found myself at the British Museum's outstation in the northeast corner of London, looking at their general plateau collections not on display uh, downtown in London. I contacted the staff earlier about their plateau collections in general and specifically in search of this Spokane Salmon Chiefs War Club described in Lord's text. It was clear from the text and further investigation by Spokane tribal members over decades that the club was at the museum, although no one had seen it. Using the basic description I provided and the original reference number we were able to dig up from their internal database, the museum staff were able to locate, after three tries, what I thought was the Salmon, War Chief, the Salmon Chief's War Club, but I could not be sure myself. After examining the club and looking at the records we had from the archives, the collections assistant allowed me to photograph the object with my phone. Luckily, my wireless connection did not fail me, and I was able to send both email and text messages with the accompanying photo to several portal representatives. It was only a short while before I received a message that indeed, this was the Spokane Salmon Chiefs War Club that sat before me in the northeast side of London. Michael Holloman, a Colville tribal member and the director of the Plateau Center for American Indian Studies at WSU at the time, noted to me upon seeing the image in a text message, quote, to the people of the Spokane tribe in Washington state, this club is a spirit waiting to be held and acknowledged again, as the tribe continues to welcome back its vast cultural heritage for future generations. Due to British law, however, the collections assistant told me quite solemnly, the object could not be physically repatriated to the Spokane tribe but they would be happy to provide a high resolution image of it. But the answer came back. This was not acceptable to the Spokane tribe. By not challenging the colonial legal fictions of ownership that originated from territorial dis dispossession, the museum broke off the possibilities of re reciprocal exchange. 
They failed to imagine themselves as a link in the chain. It's good, it is a good reminder that there are very real limits for digital return. There are times when physical materials must be held, touched, used, and passed on, when they must be in the rivers and valleys from which they belong, and clearly from the historical record from where they came. On a second journey closer to home, we tried again. This time, starting in earnest in 2014, we worked closely with the Northwest, Indian, Indian, uh, the Northwest Museum of Art and Culture and their American Indian Cultural Committee to enact this model of collaborative curation to provide both physical and digital access to the museum's plateau basket collection and archival photos. So over three years, we worked slowly to bring elders to the museum and to the collections room that was already designated with access protocols. The sign that, sa that hangs outside the door marks it clearly, sacred room, restricted access. The plateau collections are kept separate from other materials in the museum and archives, restricted to the general public, but accessible to plateau community members. So over three years, I worked closely with Warm Springs community members and elders and basket weavers. In particular, Valerie Switzler, Arlita Rowan, Susie Slockish, and Maxine Switzler, all pictured here. The first year, Valerie eagerly climbed through the storage shelves, pulling out baskets, turning them over, tapping them, and looking closely for telltale signs of WASCO work. You'll notice that some of the times the women are wearing gloves, and sometimes not. The standard policy for museums are not enforced in the plateau room. In fact, community members are encouraged to touch, hold, speak to, listen to, and interact with the collections however they wish. After Valerie made several solo visits, she consulted with the elders in her tribe and brought back small groups each time, looking over more baskets, beaded bags, and one very precious wedding veil, and hundreds of archival photos. During those sessions, with their permission, I started by jotting down notes. Then we recorded some of the discussions on my phone. And finally, at the end of the third year, they provided traditional knowledge and cultural narratives that we incorporated into the latest version of the portal. So looking at a display page from the portal helps us see how this all comes together from a viewer's perspective. This is one of the several root gathering bags chosen by the Warm Springs tribe for the collection. So the tab at the top you'll see denotes the museum record. You can see the institutional metadata on the right from the museum's record and the description that they had in their catalog. Pretty standard. Round twine cylindrical corn husk bag. Through community curation, Warm Springs community members added their own record with additional metadata. So as we tab across the top, we don't leave the page. We see the Warm Springs community record. We now have a new title chosen by the representatives. No longer root gathering basket, but duck basket. We have protocols for access, in this case public, why I'm showing it today. And a traditional knowledge label, in this case an attribution label that defines attribution to Warm Springs tribe and Wasco basket makers not the non-native collector. And I'll come back to the TK labels in a moment. And in the cultural narrative and traditional knowledge fields, fields that don't exist in other content management systems, we have narrations by named individuals and members of the community. And because these fields allow any file format, we now have added layers of traditional knowledge. Yeah, to me, this looks like a legend on this bag after uh, you look at it and see that this is Spilia, Spiliai, the legendary, then the Khat Khat, the ducks. Back in those days, you know, um, the people themselves argued over how the duck made its sound. And he says, you know, it goes like this. The other one says, chow, no. It goes like this. And Coyote was listening to them. Pretty soon they separated. 
it did the attack. The people divided up because they, the ones that agreed, this is the way he's, the duck makes a sound, and the others said, no, it's this way. So she div they divided up and left, and lived somewhere else. My grandpa used to say that one of these days, I know I'm going to go north, and I'm going to hear Wasco people talking, and it'll it'll be our long lost relatives. <laughs> <laughs> See, here they are talking. Uh -huh. Yeah, they're talking. <laughs> so you you need to take a picture and tell a story like that. <laughs> After three years of slowing down and not rushing to digitization or putting something up online without consultation, the duck basket comes to life. We no longer see a round, twine, cylindrical bag. We know the story of its creation. We heard the language, the sound of the ducks, traditional cultural knowledge about its origins, family histories, and tribal histories all in one place. Similarly, a set of lantern slides in the WSU Special Collections that we were also working with, with at this time had little or no metadata. We really only knew from the description on the box that we quite literally stumbled over in our special collections that they were from the Chamawa boarding school, which held native children from across the country. We see that the university description from the box said a slide showing the inside of the bakery at Chamawa. Although the slides were largely of interior shots of buildings of the or the grounds, we maintained our protocol of not digitizing or making them publicly viewable on the portal without tribal consultation. And we were glad that we did. Over years of collaborating with three of the native communities whose children have been taken ch to Chamawa as part of federal Indian policies, it was emotional and traumatic for some of them to see these black and white images that appeared sterile to us seemingly devoid of emotion, but holding so many complicated memories. After discussion and reparation, the tribes made many of the slides available on the site. And now we have multiple records from several tribes and individual community members. And importantly, each record can have its own protocols for access and its own narrative or sets of narratives. In the Umatilla record, we have a narrative from Percy Bingham, now an elder, but who lived at Chamawa boarding school in his youth. Chamawa was, well, for breakfast, well, twice a week we'd have cornmeal mush. And uh, there'd be big worms in that mush, and if you didn't set that damn worm aside and eat that mush, you didn't get any more. That was it. From Percy's words, that coal black and white photo of the boarding school bakery is brought to life through his story of the everyday cultural violences of boarding schools, having to eat the worm in the porridge to survive. We can feel the effects of Indian policies of removal. We're asked to sit with the reflections, the unease. These examples from the portal are meant to highlight the ways that institutions can choose to be links in a chain. For us at WSU, that meant that we also had to provide the tools to make this work happen elsewhere. The portal was the beta version of Mukadu CMS, a free and open source content management system and community digital platform built from the ground up with the idea that there are ethical ways of relating to tangible and intangible forms of knowledge, grounded in physical places, relationships, and enduring social systems. So today, Mukadu, uh, as of last week, is at a 2.08 release. And it allows for the local, for local protocol-driven access and circulation of content. So that is, any community can define what their protocols are in any instance of Mukadu. It allows for multiple layers of community narration and attribution. So you saw with the example of the portal, there isn't one file with one record. You can have multiple records for any file and multiple levels and layers of attribution. And it's totally configurable and customizable to cultural, social, and linguistic needs of any size community, cultural center, library, archive, or museum. That is, we knew that a one-size-fits-all software design model wouldn't work here. We needed the flexibility to be able to accommodate indigenous communities from Oklahoma to the outback, from Sydney to Saskatoon, and also be a viable option for non-indigenous institu institutions from large federal repositories to local university libraries. 
So Mukudu is currently being used by over 250 communities, institutions, and groups worldwide. From the Zuni Public Library in New Mexico with a staff of one, to the State Library of New South Wales in Sydney with a digital experience team and an indigenous library team to manage their collections. So there's no one profile for Mukudu users except the common ground of growing from local indigenous needs. At its core, Mukudu values relationships. In, war among, in the Warmungu language, Mukudu literally means dilly bag. Elders would keep sacred materials in the dilly bag and younger generations had to ask for permission. They had to approach elders to ask for them to be open up, to teach and to share. And the elders in turn had to open those up. But it was a reciprocal relationship and it's built on that foundation of reciprocity, of intergenerational knowledge sharing and exchange. Mukudu then, as Michael Jumbin Jones translated it to me, is a safe keeping place. Jumbin connected the images we were looking at after our first trip to the National Archives in 2002 to the land we were sitting on when he told me that, quote, all places have stories and all stories are placed. And it's that groundedness in place, people and ancestors and valuing their proper relationships, those intergenerational connections and conditions that the dilly bag opens up that Mukudu CMS seeks to uphold. As a tool and a platform for the circulation of cultural belongings and knowledge, Mukudu can encourage a set of respectful relationships and obligations by promoting knowledge sharing and circulation based in local conceptions of access. It is, however, a tool, a platform. It cannot do any of this without all of us. In any instance of Mukudu, there are three structural elements that are defined internally to promote these relationships. We call them the three C's. Communities. You have to define the who of Mukudu. Who are the stakeholders and contributors to the site? You can have one, you can have 50, you can have 500. You saw that in the portal. But it doesn't, nobody goes unnamed. And then secondly, cultural protocols. The how of Mukudu. How is content and metadata shared? What protocols might there be for access? And there can be any combination, community only, elders, youth, and any combination of those to provide granular levels of access. And finally, the third C, categories, the what of Mukudu, those vocabularies most meaningful to the communities engaging with the content, duck baskets, not loop gathering bags. Any instance of Mukudu has these elements as its core architecture, and you really can't start using Mukudu without it. Um, so this is how we sort of encourage those connections I was talking about. Alongside Mukudu and growing from our years of work with the portal is the Local Context Initiative that I said I would get back to. It's a platform that my colleague Jane Anderson at NYU and I designed to provide information about and practical solutions for the intellectual property rights complications faced by indigenous peoples worldwide as they seek to share and steward their digital cultural heritage materials. We were inspired by Creative Commons licenses and we sought to embed indigenous access protocols into a similar license structure. However, the legacies of colonial collection and research mean that indigenous communities do not today, under Western legal regimes, own or hold copyright to much of their cultural patrimony, hence the Spokane uh, Salmon Chiefs War Club. Instead, a majority of these materials are either in the public domain, and they got there dubiously, obviously, or owned by third parties, us, libraries, archives, and museums. So licenses wouldn't suffice. So fair trade labels, though, gave us a model to think about providing added information about access and use protocols without the legal constraints of intellectual property rights law. So we've developed a set of traditional knowledge labels to deal specifically with the circulation of indigenous digital cultural heritage materials. The TK labels are importantly an educational and a social intervention. They do, that does not mean that there also needs to be a legal intervention. There absolutely needs to still be legal intervention, but this is one step. It's educational and it's social. So much like the fair trade labels, 
TK labels provide added information. They help us all make informed and ethical decisions about their use, reuse, and circulation. So for example, a seasonal label allows communities to tell others that the materials here are generally seen or heard during certain seasons. So the Pokagon Band of Potawatomi, in their instance of Mukudu, they use previously public recordings and they put a seasonal label on it that says, we normally listen to these after the first snow falls. As a listener on the site, you'd get to decide, are you gonna respect that and act responsibly or not? The Skolitz Band of Stolo First Nation have used traditional knowledge labels on their Fraser Valley River website. If you haven't seen it, I please go and visit it. It's stunning and amazing. Uh, it's a site built by the community uh, with the express purpose of educating the Canadian public about the Scowlitz people, culture, and very specific archaeological and territorial sites in their area that have been of fascination to non-First uh, Nations community members. You can see at the top of the site, they chose four TK labels to run across the whole site. And they define what they meant by each label. Attribution, non-commercial, outreach, and ver verified. So together, they make a clear statement about the use, reach, and proper acknowledgement of the content on this site. It's like a user agreement when you go to their site. Each label has been customized by the Scowlets so that, for example, the attribution label reads. The attribution label literally means name and place in our language. We ask everyone that visits this website to attribute our knowledge and histories to us, the Skolitz people, a tribe of Stolo. Our history has not always been respected or told correctly. Here we tell our own story in our own words. We are both the holders and caretakers of our own lands, resources, and histories. It is the responsibility of our families and communities as Stolo people to take care of things in a respectful way please feel free to contact us with further questions about attribution. A very clear statement that, if respected, can go a long way to change the dynamics of circulating digital cultural heritage. The Skolitz also guide users throughout the site through the use of TK labels on very specific content. They've grouped together content by each label. So you can see here the secret sacred label, hachak in Hokaminam. These are almost exclusively used on their website for ancestral mounds. So while they invite viewers to, quote, view their belongings, a very purposeful word choice, not all are, in fact, viewable. The secret sacred label actually replaces the archaeological images of burial sites and human remains, images that continue to provoke ongoing historical trauma through their unthoughtful circulation in some archives. So in this way, the Skolitz provide information both about how they understand the viewing of human remains and why they choose not to circulate or recirculate those images. Similarly, we've been working the last three years with the Passamaquoddy Nation and the Library of Congress to add TK labels to a set of wax cylinder recordings, the oldest in Native North America, by uh, anthropologist Jesse Walter Fuchs in 1890. After some digital restoration this past April, we returned 31 digital files to the Passamaquoddy Nation. And over the last several months, they have had listening se sessions throughout their community. They've refound words um, that have not been spoken, and they've heard beats that have fallen out of use. And Passamaquoddy language teachers are using the recordings in their classes. But importantly, for public circulation of approved digital files, they guided the updated records in the Library of Congress's online catalog. So here's the previous record, the title, Passamaquoddy War Song, Trading Song. And the rights field, held by the Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Ethnology, Harvard Museum. Now, as of about a week ago, the updated title, we have the Passamaquoddy name for the trading song in their language. And an updated uh, rights and access field. There are three TK labels, attribution, non-commercial, and outreach, all customized and the main headings translated into Passamaquoddy with the Peabody Museum listed second. 
So the TK label icons that I just showed you and the Passamaquoddy custom label text have not been added to the Library of Congress website yet. They're in the process and they'll go live this winter. But we have them in the Passamaquoddy people's own Mukadu site and you can see them here. So for example, the attribution label, they've translated to, this is how it is done. This is the right way. Taken together, these examples I've given you today are not meant to be tales of bad colonial museums versus good post-colonial ones. I wish it were so easy. My intent has been instead to illustrate these examples, um, the levels at which and through which we need to be constantly vigilant to trouble the embedded notions of access and technological utopianism we often default to without much thought. These examples remind us that the history of technological advances of cataloging, collecting, recording, and display cannot be detached from the histories of dispossession of indigenous lands and bodies. Native artist Zig Jackson's fo provocative photograph, shooting them, shooting us, captures this ongoing tension and at the same time poignantly illustrates the pushback and response to these legacies of looking and taking. It reminds us that not all material is meant to be viewed, digitized, remembered, or preserved. It reminds us of the trouble with access. In her most recent book, feminist scholar Donna Haraway suggests that we stay with the trouble, that we continue to be open to, quote, unexpected collaborations and combinations. She suggests that staying with the trouble requires a material semiotics, which is always situated, someplace, and not no place, entangled and worldly. I suggest today then that we can start with everyday steps in our own locations by first foregrounding indigenous territorial relationships through institutional agreements that highlight the long-term over the short-term quick turnaround. Second, we can add steps to all of our workflows that account for multiple values and voices from not seeing to seeing more than one view. Third, we can update our institution or our department's policies and mission statements to support diverse access parameters and protocols. And finally, we can work to undo the legal fictions of ownership by providing alternative licenses and labels and strategies or ignoring the ones that are there, that are given. These are practical steps that ask us to imagine how we can weave together collective futures that value sovereignty in all of its forms, from the physical to the intellectual to the emotional. After 23 years of working together, I sat last month in the Northern Territory of Australia with Michael Jumbin Jones, both of us looking a little older and grayer, once again in the back, of, uh, the back room of the Ninkanunu Art and Culture Center uh, that he helped imagine and build as a physical reminder of the enduring presence of Warramungu people in their country. We looked at an updated version of Mukudu for the community. We recorded stories he wanted to leave for his grandkids, and he recalled holding my children, now teenagers, as infants. Without falling into nostalgia that promotes a type of historic amnesia, we can look to the future, fully aware of our own histories and cognizant of the hard work ahead. This will not be easy, it will not be quick. It requires a determined focus. And with that, it can foster extended networks, links in a new chain that aren't about providing access to some, but being accountable to all. Thank you. I am happy to <coughs> take questions and stop talking at you. Uh, if anybody would like to step up to the microphone. Don't be shy. Don't be Canadian. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, I was 
waiting to see if others had questions. I actually was writing down a, a question while you were talking. And um, familiar with your work, we, we, we recommended in the Digital Scholarship Center at, at McMaster uh, Makutu to a number of graduate students who are working with materials where they should develop this kind of awareness. And it's been really successful. The question, it's sort of, there's something about it that troubles me, though. And I, I'm curious if it troubles you, too, which is that in libraries and archives, we, we often preach the gospel of transgression you know, un taking information out of its dark corners and putting it out into the world. And so with, with a hegemonic culture, with a, with a culture that imposes itself, not ha that is not imposed upon, um, we, we apply the logic of, you know, we need to break down the barriers, hence, you know, creative commons and the urge to push things into the public domain. So when you talk about, I, I actually wrote down the word, the, the language you use, you were talking about working uneth unethically that this helps you, this prevents you from working unethically if you, if you respect traditional knowledge and you apply these kinds of, of labels. But w do we have the same obligation to behave so ethically with, with hegemonic cultures? Do we have an, an ethical obligation not to behave in that way? And the related question to that is, what happens when a hegemonic culture begins to apply this logic to their materials and say, which they do of course routinely all the time every day, and say, well, we can't reveal this because it's harmful, or we can't put this out in the world because it, it undermines things, or they begin to rewrite their history. Um, and so this, this, the, the, the logic of, of traditional knowledge can be really perverted if it's, if it's applied by traditional, uh, by, a, by a hegemonic culture. And so I'm just curious if, I'd, I'd love to hear what you think about this. Uh, yeah, I get some variation of this question um, all the time. And I think it's because it's troubling it's you know uncomfortable for us to um, take that challenge to understand that our physical structures, our institutions, our laws uh, dictated by the hegemonic culture that you so aptly described there um, have sought through these policies and through this notion of transgression, this notion of openness to erase all of the other myriad of systems that are there. So I think acting ethically does not mean that we act the same in all situations. Um, and in fact, that's uh, what I take from Leanne Simpson and other indigenous communities around the world is that there is no level playing field. There isn't. It's not there. We that, that's a privileged perspective. And it's a privileged perspective to think that our technologies are somehow leveling the field. So, um, what I would say is one, that acting ethically in terms of indigenous collections requires a different perspective and a different set of tools and relationships than one would act ethically towards, let's say, medical records from a non-native Canadian hospital, right? So there, there is not a blanket way of acting ethically because we have to start from genocide, territorial dispossession, and a playing field um, that will never be level. So we have to start there. So ethics is not a blanket we can put over everything. Does that, does that answer your question? Okay. And people will, you know, use things perversely one way or the other. We've, sh we, uh, sorry, this is an addendum, but the traditional knowledge labels, you know, people have said, well, you know, what if someone else uses them? If we take that what if, right? If we get scared into that, what if I do this? What if there's a takedown notice? And that's why I was encouraging you, use alternative licenses and labels, whether they're ours or others, but also just don't be afraid to try something. We're so afraid of the legal structures because we're programmed to. We're, we, we, we police ourselves. In libraries and archives, we're policing ourselves at the expense of undoing that. That's where I think we have to take the chance and we have to speak truth to power back to those people and say, guess what? <laughs> no, because this is different. This situation is categorically different because it starts from here. Sorry, that was a little luxury. I am a professor, so sorry. <laughs> One of my hats, yes. That was just inspiring. <laughs> I'm glad that was the word you chose. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have um, best practices for getting people within the institution bought into this concept of changing, you know, yeah. our practices and stuff? 
Um, I don't necessarily we I'd say we that I have best practices. My advice from uh, decades into doing this is um, don't go away. So where's the administrators? Did they go away already? Yeah. <laughs> so um, <laughs> I at the the one of the very first meetings I was at. I I got my PhD in 2004. I started at WSU in 2005. There was also already the Native American Advisory Board to the president, and I was showing them the, our very, very, very alpha version of Mukadu that I was using with the War Among and Tennant Creek, just in that. And that's when this idea started coming that, you know, we should do this. And um, they said, one of the um, elders looked at me and he said, what happens when you leave, Kim? <laughs> I was like, I just got here. I don't know. Like, I don't even have tenure yet. So, but that, but that he was saying that, right? He was like, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> this is my land. It was my land. This is my home. You people have our stuff, and we're trying to figure out. So, but what I, what I did was like, okay, this can't be about Kim. This is not about me. This is not about the library. This is about the university. So, um, some people say I'm stubborn. I like to think of it as tenacious or something else, but. Uh, it took me about four and a half years, but we got um, we got signed by the provost and the deans of the libraries to manage the portal, its content, and its technologies in perpetuity. I have that signed. Yes. So that's very important for a number of reasons. I listed all those things because when I have to go to the new digital initiatives librarian or the new, whom I love, or the new this or the new that, and they, they could say, oh, we don't have the server space. Oh, that's too expensive now, blah, blah, And I go, perpetuity, forever, dude. We gotta do this, so let's just work it out. I think as state universities, and I don't, I don't know what you call yourselves here in Canada, but as state universities with a land grant mission, which we have, it's our responsibility. So because if we leave it to, well, you have to maintain that on your servers, right? Because it's expensive, it's not democratizing. Let's stop saying that. This is hard, expensive, long-term work that none of us can predict in 10 years how much it's gonna cost to store this. So as universities, we have to just make that commitment. And we find budgets for a whole bunch of other things. I don't know about you guys, but we pay a lot for a football stadium, $5 million. Wow, this is still live streaming? <laughs> I think priorities. <laughs> Nobody's, I say this stuff all the time. So in, in any case, I forgot your question, but did I answer it? You have, to, <laughs> you have to be determined. You have to get things in writing. That's why I'm saying structural level is really important. I meant that phrase, and maybe you don't have it here in Canada. I don't know, the tip to tail, because we really do. We need MOUs. We need workflows. Like we have, oh, I'm not an archivist or a librarian by training. But now I love workflows, right? And y'all love them, and that's fine. Let we, I'm not asking you to give up your workflows. I'm asking you to create new ones. I'm asking you to insert. And so we've had to do that at WSU. So we changed our, updated our collections policy, updated our reading room policy. Look at your reading room policies. Are they prohibitive? Do they, are, do, they in, uh, do they in fact bring fear, like Leanne Simpson talked about? Does somebody have to show a government ID? Do they have to put on gloves? Do they have to be quiet? Can they not take a photo? I have stories about that, but after the live streaming. But it, it, so policies, workflows are important. And then I can't say enough, this, this rush, this urgency that we have that's attached to the digital at this sort of narrative level that we have, this fast, go, go, go. I talk over and over again about slowing down. That record that you saw from the Warm Springs woman took three years. I would much rather have that three years in that record than flat twined corn, hug, corn husk basket. Right? What does that teach me? I mean, I have eyes, I can see it. Other than that, that description doesn't do anything except for objectify that material. It disassociates it with the people, the place, and the language. So it does more damage. Putting those sterile records up does more damage. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. What I'm hearing is like, as you said, like, you said language, settlers, mm -hmm. 
top down, bottom up. It happens simultaneously, yeah. It was both. So we, we work at an MOU level because we are a state institution. I'm an employee of the state of Washington for now. Yeah. Yeah, right, that's what I'm saying. But so we engage at that level, and then the tribes decide at that level who's going to be involved in terms of administering content on the site and making decisions. Some tribes have uh, put together culture committees that they run stuff by. Like, everybody does it different. The, the point is we don't dictate that. Because they're a sovereign nation, they, they will determine. So we do that at a government-to-government -government level, but then the grassroots happens. We just got a grant, and we'll be working on this for the next two years, which is going out into the communities. Now that, after eight or nine years, there's enough content in there to make a meaningful impact, how do the communities want to use it? How do they want to share it? Do they want to share it with the non-tribal schools? Do they want to have uh, college professors use some of the content for classes? So we're exploring all of that. So it has to happen both ways bottom up, top down. You do, you do in fact though for the long view, for the long game which we're all in, for the types of changes that we're talking about, you do have to get those institutional commitments. Because whether we like it or not, deans change, provosts change, presidents change, they all, everybody's gonna come and go, including us. But if you have it in a document and the next one of you, whatever your title is, the next one of you comes in and this is part of what they have to do, it's harder to dismantle that part of the system. Do we have time for one question? Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry. So, um, this may be a philosophical question, but we can maybe take no, it off, offline. Okay. But um, <laughs> um, the idea of uh, TK levels really intrigues me and it's fascinating. But I wanted to understand that in it's part of organizing knowledge from a very um, philosophical point of view. And in the Western world, in library schools, we're conditioned about control vocabulary and all the ontologies. Yes, conditioned is right, yes. Yeah, so I just wanted to capture your thoughts on the change in mindset or do that practice or knowledge is still applicable in organizing the knowledge, the matter knowledge. Um, we can talk about Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you probably guess my, my uh, theories on controlled vocabularies. Controlled vocabularies are much, um, controlled vocabularies are meant to provide order. We're very obsessed with order, you know, particularly in these crowds of libraries and archivists, you know, we all have a certain personality preference that we tend to organizing. And so that's why it gets all uneasy and it's like, I don't know, I don't know what to do with this. The very lovely metadata librarian at the Library of Congress, Maggie Cruz, and I have had all kinds of talks about this. It's been over the years because it's this attachment to creating order that, you know, whether it's through subject headings, whether it's through mark records, what, you know, whatever that is. But I'm here to tell you, it's an illusion. You cannot control this. That's why it's in the rivers, it's in the valleys, it's in, right? Let's think about this. You put, it, you put a box around it and you tag a number to it and you think it's organized. Why? I, first time I looked at a mark record, I'm like, what the hell is that? <laughs> Who came up with this system? And, why, and I'm like, why does it start here? And what the, and I am American and I'm like as privileged and white and university educated as you can get. And I didn't know what to do with it. <laughs> I was like, so who does this make sense to? And it's like, oh, you got to talk to so-and-so or this, right? So the organization is, it's complete folly. Sorry, I've either had too much coffee or not enough, but like, it's just, it, you know, it, so library schools are a problem. And I don't know, yeah. <laughs> How much time do we, we're just going to take this over. They're a problem, I'll tell you why, because there have been a f we I do we do get outreach from various professors at i schools at library schools teaching our who reach out to us and say oh we've heard about Mukadu, we've heard about the TK labels we want to introduce our students and that's great I hope there's a new generation of it these young archivists and librarians coming up but I just was at the Society for American Archivists Museum in Portland and I'm here to tell you we have a long way to go because. We have our standard courses that still perpetuate standing off to the side, 
being objective, pretending that you can put a number on it, and it's not about context and relationships. And so until we change the structure of what library schools, information schools teach at that really basic level, we're going to continue to have this conversation at Access 2027. Really, right? So what can you do in your classrooms? What can you do in your own institutions? Because it will spread. I've watched Mukadu spread, you know, as this little thing that started with me and Mr. Jones, you know, in 2002 to where it is today as an open source piece of software that's being used that's more importantly, it's getting people to ask questions. The software itself, as I said, can't do anything. It's, it's a piece of software, right? But what you're going to do with it, the questions you have, the questions you bring to bear on it. So I would say anything that makes you feel comfortable in your libraries or archives or classrooms, step back from it. Say, what would make me uncomfortable? And sit with that for a while. I mean, it can sound really fuzzy, this stay with the trouble, but it's not. It really isn't, because it's in those moments that we can pivot to something else. And so I would suggest that that's what we need to do with access, is pivot away from those standard notions. And I'm done. Thank you. <laughs>